Okay, good good evening everyone. Welcome to our live broadcast. Last night I said something that I think I want to expand upon and it's that just in passing I mentioned that religion Religion is, uh, as it's classically understood or, or conventionally understood, it's a, it's a powerful force. Religion will lead good people to become bad people, bad people to become good people. It will lead people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. There's a, a tremendous force that is caught up in this realm of human activity that we call religion. And so I thought I'd like to take this opportunity today to get religious. Right? This is something that I think most of you know I'm not much about I don't have a lot of rituals and adherence to cultural Buddhist practices but I think there's something to be said for religiosity the power of it so I'd like us all to spend some time reflecting on this and, and maybe uh, consider how we can incorporate religion into our lives. Now I'm, I'm doing some research right now or, or trying to formulate an argument in favor of a more inclusive, less specific and less biased definition of the word religion one that really does it justice as a word and so it's something along the lines of religion is whatever you take seriously I think that definition would be um, unfavorably looked upon by most religious by many religious people who who think there's something more. Now my argument is that most often the more is uh, arbitrary and based on biases in regards to what one the individual takes seriously. So I take this seriously. So I think that's what religion's all about. It's kind of bizarre, actually, how. Otherwise, rational people become well. They become ir irrational in many ways, but this is a, this is one of them. And thinking that uh, the most important things in life are those things that I think are most important. And no one else could possibly think other things are more important. If they did, we should dismiss and disregard. And it's not true religion. But I think it could possibly be argued, uh, and it has been argued, and actually this is what the courts in Canada and America and you know, around the world have been dealing with, coming to terms with this idea of religion and how to, how to uh, allow for religious activity, to privilege religious activity without privileging certain types of religious activity. So you need a definition that is yet at once restrictive enough to privilege certain types of activity, privilege a certain level of religiosity, and yet uh, inclusive enough and general enough to not privilege only certain types of intense religiosity. And so they come up with this idea of 
that which relates to prof profound ideas about existence, about goal, the goal of or the purpose of life, etc., etc. For, the, for tonight's purpose, I just want us to think of religion as uh, a sort of an, a rather intense and maybe even extreme. Uh, that's probably the wrong word, but a uh, a level of religiosity that takes us out of our comfort zone, that forces us to let go. Right, a lot of religion. Not just Buddhism talks about letting go, but what they mean is give yourself up to God, usually. And that that feeling of giving yourself up to a higher power, well, many people have said that's religion, but there is something very religious about it. I don't know, mine, mine shows it as red. Maybe you're just not close enough. Oh, here we are. Why was that down there? I found the problem. Should be better now. Let me know if it is. Let me know if it isn't. So I, I want to actually work with these kinds of ideas, the idea of letting go, the idea of uh, surrender. But but of course, as Buddhists, we want to make sure that we're, we're still objective. I think it's possible to be objectively religious, meaning we don't um, become particular. We don't give ourselves up to a, cert, a, a specific, uh, to something that is... We don't give ourselves up to to some aspect of samsara, really. We give ourselves up to... Well, we'll talk about what we give ourselves up to. I'm just failing all over tonight. Okay. The live stream is now up. Or is it? And the live stream is now is not up. What's going on here? Incorrect password. Seriously? What's going on? Oh. Hmm. Alright. Okay, now the live stream should be up. Technology. Technology and religion. What a combination. Anyway, the point is I'd like us I'd like to offer you the opportunity to get religious. You don't have to. I think that's the that's important is that I'm not going to push you, but I want to be clear that that's that's the topic of tonight to potentially challenge some of our um secular secularist attachments, our unwillingness to commit ourselves Unwillingness to let go and fully submerse ourselves in an experience. We're often afraid of religion, and rightly so. Religion can be pretty terrible. That's not the problem of the word religion or the, the category of religion. And I think that's the point, is that we can come up with Buddhist religion, and we have. And this is religion that, as Buddhists, we can we find palatable. It's religion, it, it shows that 
the problem is not with the category of religious activity where you fully immerse yourself and fully commit yourself to something. The whole point is committing yourself to the right thing, which is, of course, the scary thing. How do you know what's right? So I'm going to go through it. And I think for many people this isn't objectionable for those of you who are Buddhists or Buddhist practitioners. We have what we call a... a ceremony to take on or to enter into the meditation practice. And this is what I went through when I first started meditating and I've helped m countless people and lots and lots of people through this ceremony. I've stopped doing it since I've been in Canada but not for any particular reason except that it's been We've been busy setting up the center. And it's the kind of thing you really need a, a, a staff, you need people to help you with, to to really do a proper ceremony. But I'm going to go through the concept of the opening ceremony or the ceremony to receive the meditation practice. It comes actually from the the Visuddhimagga and the, the the tradition, the ancient tradition on the sorts of things you need to um, set yourself in or settle yourself in before you practice meditation. So it's not just arbitrary. It's uh, based, I guess, you could say, much very much on the. Um, the arakaka matana, the, the 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 types of meditations that protect and support insight meditation, and you should recognize some of them as we go through it. The first thing you do, though, this is a very old tradition, is you this is from the Visuddhimagga and probably before. You give yourself up to the Buddha. You really do. Buddhists actually do this. I'd like to invite you all to. To think about this Mahasi Sayada gives a good explanation in, in one of his books About how giving yourself up to the Buddha Is a psychological support It's putting your uh, Putting your fate Or your, your well-being In the hands of the Buddha That's why we take refuge In the Buddha Because we think of the Buddha As someone great Someone powerful I mean, it's the same sort of psychological benefit of putting your trust in God. Of course, there's no God up there, and there's certainly no Buddha up there who's going to hear your prayers. That's not the point. The point is the psychological, um, well, the, the, the commitment in your mind. And so we actually, we recite in Pali, the words are, Imahang Bhagava Atabhavang Tumhakang Parichachami. And we recite that and then translate it. It means Imahang uh, Bhagava Atabhavang. I give this, O oh Blessed One, I give this Atabhava, this self, this being that uh, of my being. I entrust it into your care. I hand it over to you. So in the Visuddhimagga, in description of this, this, uh, and this uh, determination, it describes the sort of people who are ideal for practicing meditation. They're the kind of people who uh, are ready to die for the meditation. They're ready to to sacrifice their own lives. They have such great faith and such great conviction. That's the best sort of meditator, it says. I mean, you could argue that too much faith could be a bad thing if the person is can get stuck on the wrong path and just go with it. But the ability to give yourself up and to detach yourself from your ordinary um, 
predilections, your ordinary hang-ups, your ordinary personality, you know. Meaning, give yourself up. Take your whole being and just plunk it down in the realm of Buddhism. So we make this determination. We say, I give myself up to you, O Blessed One. It's very religious, no? I think it's interesting. It's interesting to note that Buddhism can be very religious, if you let it. And I think safely so, because we're not deviating from the path. We're just intensifying it. Intensification can be scary, but it's not always wrong. As long as the 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 as long as the um, principles are true, are are stick to the, prop, the the what is right, right. So we're not deviating from the path by placing our trust in the Buddha. We're just intensifying it and really committing ourselves and saying, okay. I really do trust the Buddha. It sounds very religious. <laughs> it sounds like what Christians would say, but we, you know, there's a power to it, and a good power in this case. And then secondly, you do the same thing with your teacher. So the teacher will be sitting at the front and you will say to the teacher, Imahang acharya atabhavang tumhakang parijachami. I give this. I give this being over to you, O oh teacher. I entrust it in your care. I mean, part of this is is overcoming the. Doubts and skepticism, and that, that that really are inevitably and and in the final form, uh, they're a hindrance. In the beginning, of course, you want to be circumspect and and investigate the teacher, but to some extent, at least to some extent, you want to give yourself over to the experience. Now, you can keep in the back of your mind; you don't you don't give up your rational. Um, observation and, and analysis of whether this is actually good for you but you put some trust in both the Buddha and in your teacher and it's great it's important psychologically because too often we have meditators come and they're full of doubts about the practice and I think it's it's useful to give yourself up to things, and if you're not, you know, unless you're terribly blind. I mean, most of us are intelligent. I think we're all intelligent people, and eventually you'll find out whether your trust was misplaced or not. But uh, if you're if you're if you're constantly doubting what you're doing, you know, you'll never have that experience. And I'm not saying this is how you have to go about it, but it can be useful. To give yourself up to the religion So that's the second thing Then third thing you do is you ask for the kamatana You actually make a request We don't go around pushing meditation on others The Buddha was fairly careful about this, right? And from the very beginning He wasn't even going to teach he was, he was in a sense, you could say, stubborn Sticking to his guns he was he, he he made a determination that he would just pass away without teaching anyone unless someone came and, ta and and asked him to teach and so we we take this stance of letting go ourselves not preaching not proselytizing not trying to convert everyone we leave the door open and this is very much in line with the the Principles of renunciation and and letting go, not clinging. So we require the meditators to come and ask for this. Another another aspect of this is is making it clear that this is something that is being given to you. Right? It's not something you deserve or we have an obligation to give you. Uh, this isn't the right. So you go to many meditation centers and they charge you for it, 
and I've I've talked several times about how dangerous and problematic that is because then you feel entitled. The whole relationship is different. I can tell you to, you know, stay up all night, or I can tell you, well, I can tell you to do all sorts of crazy things. But no, but I can, I can tell you to, um, I can push the meditators because well, I mean, I'm not getting paid for this. I don't have any responsibility to coddle you. It really is my way or the highway. To some extent, I mean, we're, we're we are we're quite flexible, but there's a there's an it's an important power, and it's a religious power. This uh, coming and asking, beseeching, <laughs> beseeching the teacher, nibbana sami bhante sachi karna thaya kamata nandehi. For the purpose of seeing clearly for myself the truth of Nibbana, please, Venerable Sir, give me the Kamatana, give me the meditation. And then my memory is, is a bit rusty as to the order, but I think the next thing we do, right, so we're ready, ready to receive the Kamatana, we first have to now establish our minds. I mean, we've already started, but we now get into certain meditations that are going to support us and calm us enough to be able to accept the meditation properly. And so the next one is, I think, metta. If I've got the order right, I probably don't. No, we'll go with it. Anyway. Provisionally, the order may be wrong. It doesn't really matter. The next thing would be metta. So you say to yourself, Ahang sukito homi, may I be happy. Well, that's why we're doing this, right? And then you can you can expand upon that. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from enmity, free from sickness, free from grief. And then you say, Sabe Satta Sukita Huntu. May all beings be happy. This is the important part. This is where you begin to settle your karmic debts, settle your uh, cycles of revenge, your grudges, your feuds, your conflicts with other people. Settle your affairs. They make a big deal about apologizing to people especially enlightened beings if you if there's any enlightened being or even spiritual you know, spiritually advanced person who you've wronged who you've maligned you should go and apologize to them and there's great emphasis placed on this because it can be a hindrance to your path and this is part of that wishing happiness Settling your thoughts towards all other beings Whether you've had grudges or problems, conflicts with them in the past You settle all that here Put it all aside, you, you leave that baggage outside the door And you enter into the temple The temple of Buddhism Right, very religious and You give up all, all your grudges And then it starts to turn serious. We contemplate death. Aduwang me jibitang. My life is unstable. Duwang maranang. Death is certain. Death is for sure. Jibitang me aniyatang. My life is uncertain. Niyatang maranang. Or maranang niyatang. Death only is certain. This again, what another you can see the pattern here. We've we've sort of dealt with the Buddha, and often this will be accompanied by recollections of the Buddha as well. 
um, and then we've done metta and now death this is one of the protective kamatanas because this one death gives you conviction and gives you encouragement it reminds you oh yeah that's why I'm doing this because all of those defilements I have that I'm building up and all the attachments and addictions they're just leading me straight to death and the danger of death is that it determines your birth your next birth if you've done bad you get bad if you've done good you'll get good so we spend some time reflecting on death at least reminding ourselves every time we we begin the meditation this is something that we do we should do and again we've been negligent here at our new center so we'll have to figure out some eventually some way to incorporate this religious aspect into it maybe at least I think we could make it optional so if someone wants to do it we could have it available and we could do the ceremony for anyone who wants to do it there's also a closing ceremony they're quite beautiful I mean the last thing you do is ask forgiveness from each other formally there's, anyway we'll, so yeah we'll get to that so after death then it gets into the actual Okay, focusing on insight meditation. You make a, rec a recollection. Ye neva yanti nibanang buddha te sancha savaka ekayanena magena satipatana sannina. Which loosely translates into. That path by which. All Buddhas and all their enlightened disciples have traveled in order to become enlightened is the path of the four Satipatthana, the Ekayana Manga of the four Satipatthana. That's a recollection we do. We remind ourselves this path that I'm following, this path that I'm undertaking now this is the path taken by all buddhas in there and like anyone who wants to become enlightened has to follow the path of satipatthana this is the path i'm entering upon it's an ancient path it's a hallowed path it's holy it is the right way the one way the only way it is the way to enlightenment And so we, we gain courage and encouragement in this way and conviction and, and sort of a sense of severity, right? This is not some hobby that we're undertaking. It's not a game that we're playing. This path, this is the path of the Buddhas. Then am I missing something? Oh, imaya dhammanu dhamma patipatiya. No, imin. Uh, oh shoot! I've got it here somewhere. Let's go look at it. Oh, I thought there was something else. Um. Anyway, if if there is something missing, I'll try and find it. But the last part is Imaya Dhamma Nudhamma Patipatiya Ratanata Yang Pujimi. And this is a fairly religious thing, but it relates it, it relates well to people who who have accepted Buddhism as their religion because we we pay respect to the Buddha. We pay respect to the Dhamma, we pay respect to the Sangha. We have this relationship psychologically with, with the Buddha as our leader and someone who we revere, bringing him, bringing, statu bringing 
flowers, candles and incense to the Buddha statues and, and so on thinking fondly and reverentially towards the Buddha bowing down before the Buddha etc we, we do this and so this last one it says through this practice of the Dhamma in order to realize the Dhamma I pay I pay homage to the triple gem to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha the three refuges and the neat thing about this is it taps into the or ties into the Buddhist idea that the best way to revere someone the best way to pay respect to anyone to the Buddha especially is to practice his teachings this is the true way you honor a Buddha the Buddha said this before he passed away he said flowers and candles and incense that's not the best way to honor a Buddha And so here's our religious practice. We can consider that another great thing we're doing is we are promoting Buddhism. We are supporting Buddhism. We are engaged in the continuation, the prolongation of the life of the Buddha's teaching in our practice of Satipatthana. Ananda was the one I think he said after the Buddha passed away he said this is it whether or not people practice the four satipatthana will determine whether the Buddha sasana lasts a long time and so here we pay the greatest and the highest respect to the Buddha through the practice of the four satipatthana Uh, there would also be in the ceremony, there would have been before this, the taking of the eight precepts, of course. There's actually a formal ceremony for taking the eight precepts. And then after this, the last thing that we would do is ask forgiveness from each other. So all the meditators would bow down to the teacher and say, Acharye pamadena dwarataye nakatang sabang paradang kamat O teacher, Acharye Pamadena Dwaratayena Katang Sabanga Paradang. All uh, any wrongdoing that I have done through the three doors, that means by way of body, by way of speech by way of of thought out of negligence out of a lack of religience or a lack of religiosity kamatthame bhante please forgive me venerable sir and then the teacher says ahangvu kamami I forgive you You as well should forgive me For such For any such thing And this is important Because even through the throughout the meditation course the Meditators can often get very angry At their teacher And that's okay They can have bad thoughts And they can make the teacher's life miserable or you know, more difficult anyway and so at the beginning of the course and at the end of the course you ask forgiveness the teacher also is not perfect may say the wrong thing may teach the wrong thing may even present a poor example of the practice and so they ask forgiveness from the students for not being perfect It's a great way to clear the air. All in all, it's quite a beautiful ceremony. Very religious. And so the argument I want to make, the, the whole point of this is to present the concept of religion to Buddhists or to people practicing Buddhist meditators as not something that should be discounted or discarded. 
it could be you don't it, you can you can avoid it or or um, minimalize the importance but uh, you could also take it up that it could be something palatable to a Buddhist we don't have to say that Buddhism is not a religion and that religious activity has no place in Buddhism because obviously there are millions of Buddhists around the globe who would disagree but I mean to some extent we 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 consider ourselves a bit elitist as being people who focus on true Buddhism right there's a lot of Buddhists out there who don't really practice on a level that we would consider proper Buddhist practice and I think it's easy to get arrogant and think oh well you know all of that Silly stuff is just culture. That's not real Buddhism, and I think it. I think we we throw the baby out with the bathwater to some extent, because the Buddha was, I think, quite religious, and promoted a sense of religiosity. And there's definitely a long tradition in the meditation tradition that I follow, of of taking it quite seriously and making it quite religious in this way, really. Devoting yourself to it in a very real, in a truly religious sort of way. So there you go. I think this is something that I've never done before: is go through in detail the opening ceremony in a video. So now we have my take on Buddhist religiosity. That's the dhamma for tonight. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. What do I think of doing past life regressions? Cons uh, you better go. This is this is yeah. Sorry, I just wait for the meditators to actually go back and meditate before we get into the speculative stuff. Uh, past life regressions. I, mean, I don't think about them so much. I think I'm gonna take a pass on that one as being one of those things I don't think about. And therefore don't have an answer. Why don't I have my meditators listen to questions? Because you all have speculative questions that are just going to make them think too much. The thing is, uh, I'm, I'm, we're on the internet, you have to remember. And so people ask me questions about crazy stuff stuff that I don't want my meditators to worry about you know, these people are doing 8, 10, 12 hours of meditation a day last thing they need is to be talking about politics one of my meditators doesn't even know who their president is she's from America and she doesn't yet know Okay, you've you've rewarded it. What is a good way to remove doubts about rebirth? I mean, I, I could have entertained that aspect of it, but I'm still not that interested in it. Like, if you have doubts about rebirth, you should say doubting, doubting. Um, you know, I, I've talked about... I, I think it, it's important to recognize the... Um, the flaw in our thinking that after death, nothing is the null hypothesis meaning that it's the default and there's no reason to think that except if you're a physicalist which is already taking something you have to take on on belief there's no reason to be a physicalist rather than a uh, you know biocentrist or a phenomenal phenomenologist positivist maybe even So, if you have doubts about if you have doubts about rebirth, I would just say doubting, doubting, and let it go. I mean, I guess the real point is I wouldn't concern too much about rebirth. 
you know, you accept, and I think that's a part of religion, is you accept these things provisionally. In the back of your mind you say, well, you know, this may all turn out to be wrong, but I'm going to give it an honest try. And you you be clear with yourself that there's no, there's no, it's not, there's no reason, there's no better evidence for after death nothing than there is for after death rebirth. Or, or birth again because what we see now is is a continuation of the mind to say that this is for some reason stops at death is is a, a, a claim you know and you have to provide backing for that and the backing of course is the idea that the brain is the source of the mind but that's never been proven there's no there's no there's no conclusive evidence, and in fact there's counter-evidence that shows that the mind seemingly can be active when the brain is not. Anyway, I've talked about all that lots and lots. It's, it's interesting stuff to talk about. It's certainly within the realm of what I should be talking about, so I don't mean to dismiss the question of why in the heck should we believe in rebirth but I have talked about it quite a bit when we're overcome with lust and desire for a person do we simply become aware of the lusting and note it until it reduces in intensity yeah not just the lust you'll note the seeing and the thinking and the feeling the pleasure of it because there's usually pr pleasure associated with lust You'll note all of that. I mean, it's certainly not easy. It's not like that's suddenly magically going to make all your problems go away. But if you get good at it, you can change your life, and you can certainly weaken and eventually give up these these relig ridiculous attachments to things that are really disgusting. You know, the human body is certainly not full of sugar and spice and all things nice. What is the difference between wanting to end samsara and vibhava tanha? Someone asked me this just yes, just this morning actually. Is it right to say the Sri Lankan couple that brought me food this morning asked me about vibhava tanha? Is it right to say that the first case is simply kusala chanda as opposed to greed? I would say wanting to end samsara is is at least dangerously close to Vibhavatana. I would say wanting to end samsara is not necessarily not not necessarily wholesome. I'd be inclined to think of it as unwholesome, very subtly unwholesome, but the kind of unwholesome that gets you born in the Brahma realms, the formless realms. Vibhavatana. It's not about not wanting to be reborn in samsara. That's just an intellectual outlook, and it's sort of an aversion. It's escapism. Buddhist practice is is about understanding samsara, seeing it clearly, and the result is not an aversion to it or a desire to be free from it. The result is an ambivalence and a disdain, not disdain, but a disregard for it. A complete and utter uh, weariness or disinterest in samsara. See, the only reason that samsara continues is because we're interested, because we like it or we dislike it. But uh, the goal is to see it, to understand it. Because when you understand it, you see this is useless. Absolutely and utterly without any purpose whatsoever. You just start to get more and more uh, disenchanted, is the word, and and peaceful as a result, until finally there's perfect peace. These emotions are so powerful and they completely hijack your mind. I've tried the meditation on the disgustingness of the body, but it doesn't help that much. 
A good one is take the body parts of the person that you find attractive and, and visualize cutting them up. Visualize slicing them up into pieces. Yeah, but it, I mean, that's temporary. That's just like putting a band-aid over it. It still doesn't stop the festering. No, that's why the satipatthana are the only way. The only way to overcome things like lust is to see the lust clearly as it is and all the aspects of it, the pleasure and the experience and the thoughts you have about it. Because it really does, once you see it clearly, you become disenchanted. You lose viraga, you lose your raga, lust. Yeah, well, if you want to lim if you want to overcome lust, stay away from people who you lust after. It's a good sort of. I mean, that's just artificial. It doesn't solve the problem. It's not the answer, but it's a good sort of stopgap measure. That's why people go to meditation centers. I remember there was one. We were doing courses before in Stony Creek, and. Uh, there are these paintings on the walls And one of them is of the daughters of Mara And of course they painted it Where you can actually see their breasts uh, it, Originally I was there when he was painting it And he originally painted it This was like 17 years ago He originally painted it with these bare, these women bare chested And then he, he the, the, the abbot complained And so he put uh, some sort of gauze, sort of a, a, it was really neat, he painted a gauze over them, like a, what do you call, some kind of s semi-transparent cloth, and uh, anyway, the, there was one of our meditators who came and, and we were giving spots, and we gave him the spot right under this thing, and he came to me all frustrated, and he said, of course I get put right under the, I have to do my walking and sitting meditation right under these sexually provocative pictures of these women. But yeah, you, you, you kind of want to avoid that sort of thing. We could set up a charnel ground in Second Life. We could uh, have models, pictures. They should. Buddha Center should have a charnel ground, a, a, a you know, place with models of dead bodies, with blood coming out and pus coming out, and pictures. You could just sit there and look at pictures of cancerous growths and pictures of cut up bodies. I mean, if you do a Google search for cancer, it's quite interesting. Google image search for different kinds of cancer Breast cancer is probably a good one That's an interesting... Uh, an interesting point about virtual reality you know you can do things i mean obviously in in horrific ways you can do things that you would never do in 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 reality but here's an interesting one a buddhist one we could actually set up a, char a virtual reality charnel ground and we wouldn't have to kill people <laughs> or we wouldn't have to find dead bodies how would that work I think pictures would be the best. You could have a room full of pictures to contemplate, photos. I don't think trying to make an actual decomposing corpse, maybe it would work. If we had a, a corpse that was scripted to decompose when you click on it, slowly, slowly decompose. Dar has a charnel ground. Hey, see, she's forward thinking. Dar has been conspicuously absent. I understand she's gone away or something. It's 
It's funny how every time I'm giving talks now, it, the sim turns dark as I give the talk. It's it's night now. It's quite the visual. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. It's always nice to meet up here. Got the regulars, and for those of you tuning in on YouTube, thank you for tuning in. Please share the videos, subscribe to the channel, etc., etc. And then there's also those of you who might be listening in on audio. Well, thank you, thank you for your patient attendance and your aspiration towards goodness. Have a good night, everyone.